Your hands have the ability to do some amazing things. Your hands have the power to heal and to forgive and to love. Your hands have the power to bless and to bring about change, to restore, to repair what has been broken. For in your hands lies a power, and it's a power to achieve and to prosper and to bring about restoration and salvation. But before I speak specifically about the potential that lies at our fingertips, first let me read to you this little passage from the book of Numbers. And I'm reading from Numbers chapter 15, looking at verses 38 to 41. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation, Numbers chapter 15. Then the Lord said to Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. Throughout the generations to come, you must make tassels, tassels for the hems of your clothing and attach them with a blue cord. When you see the tassels, you will remember and obey all the commands of the Lord instead of following your own desires and defiling yourself as you are prone to do. The tassels will help you remember that you must obey all my commands to be holy to your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, that I might be your God. I am the Lord your God. Now to you and me, this may sound like a strange kind of command to have to follow. I want you, says God, to make tassels for the hems of your clothing. And what makes this command even stronger is just um, is not just God's insistence that, that this is something that the following generations must also do. But you may be wondering what tassels have to do with our hands. Or you may be wondering what a tassel is. And not only may you be wondering what a tassel is or what it has to do with our hands, but you may be wondering what any of this has to do with the Eighth Commandment. Or you may be even wondering what is the Eighth Commandment. So let me start there. In Exodus chapter 20, we, verse 15, we have these words, these four words, four words that make up the Eighth Commandment. You must not Still, you must not still. Now, to still, just to be certain about this, is to take something which belongs to another person. So that's one problem solved. But what does stealing have to do with tassels? Well, the word clothing that was mentioned in this earlier Bible reading, I want you, says God, of tassels for the hems of your clothing, is the Hebrew word for talent. Clothing means talent. And a talent is a piece of clothing that all Jewish men were instructed to wear. I have an example of one on the screen. It looks a bit like a prayer shawl. And in Hebrew culture, the talent represented the curtain that hung in front of the Holy of Holies. It, um, if you don't know this, if you haven't come across this before, in their temple in Jerusalem, before it was destroyed, there was a section where God's presence dwelt. It was called the Holy of Holies. And it was out of bounds to 99.9% .9 of the population. Only the chosen priest was allowed to enter this area. And so to protect the sacredness of this area, they hung this massive curtain in front of the Holy of Holies, the place where God's presence dwelt. And so a talent represented the curtain, meaning that by wearing it, you were covering yourself in God's presence. And so the Hebrews believed that they could take the presence of God and literally cover themselves with it, cover themselves, flavor themselves and their lives with a presence that was bigger than theirs. And then God said to them, take the talent, talent, my presence, and add to it tassels, which were bits of thread that hung from the bottom of the talent. But they were not just for decoration or to leave hanging at the bottom of their clothing. The talents were used to tie around their hands. And you tied them around your hands for a very special purpose. 
because like the talent, the tassels represented certain elements of God. For example, each tassel had five knots in them. Five knots represented the first five books of the Old Testament, or using um, Hebrew language, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And so when you tied the tassels around your hands, what you were doing was literally tying the Word of God to yourself. Now, in between the five knots were four spaces, four spaces, and the four spaces represented the four letters of God, Yahweh. Y-W-H-W-H, Y-H-W-H, yeah, Yahweh. And so when you tied the tassels around your hands, you were tying the word of God and the name of God to yourself. Now, in each of the tassel were 613 loops. And why 613? Because in the Old Testament, there are 613 commands. And so when you tied the tassels around your hands, you were tying the word of God and the name of God and the ways of God to yourself. Now, finally, a tassel had, has eight strings, eight strings coming off from the bottom. And in Hebrew, eight represents grace, the grace of God. And so when you tied the tassels around your hands, you were tying the word of God, the name of God, the ways of God, and the grace of God to yourself. Now, of those eight strings, there were three strings, three white strings and one blue string. And they repeated this pattern twice. And this represented three in one, three in one, which is very interesting. And so when you tied the tassels around your hands, you were tying the word of God and the name of God and the ways of God and the grace of God and the nature of God to yourself. Now, as thrilling as this history lesson all is, you s still may be wondering what any of this has got to do with your hands, your hands, or the Eighth Commandment, do not steal. Back in the, the old days, long before the days of Christ's death on a cross, if the Hebrews consciously wanted to act in a way that contradicted the character of God, they first had to unwrap the tassels from their hands. Interesting, isn't it? If they wanted to act in a way that brought turmoil or anger or bitterness or revenge, they first had to unwrap God from their lives. Or if they wanted to steal from someone, steal their possessions or their life, we'd call that murder. Or commit adultery, they're stealing another man's wife or another woman's husband. Or if they wanted to bring slander to another person, which, by the way, is another form of stealing, then they would first have to unwrap the tassels from their hands. The Word of God, the name of God, the ways of God, the grace of God, and the nature of God. And when they unwrapped God from their lives... Their lives had a habit of unravelling. Their social lives, their spiritual lives, and their home life. Now, many thousands of years later, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. And in part, he touches on this theme of unravelling. And he does so by suggesting some of the ways in which we steal from God and steal from each other. So listen to these words from chapter 4 and 5. With the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do. And in, in this passage, um, Gentiles are those that have made no faith decision in Christ. So live no longer as the Gentiles do, those who have not made any faith decision in Christ, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their mind and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. 
But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. And then Paul goes on to describe what a truly righteous and holy life looks like. So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbours the truth, for we are all part of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. If you are a thief, if you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul and abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words and slander as well as all types of evil behaviour. And let there be no sexual immorality, impurity or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk or coarse jokes, these are not for you. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins for the anger of God will fall on who, all who disobey him. Don't participate in the things these people do. And then Paul says this, instead live this way, live this way. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves. There's that word, binding yourselves together with peace. So this is Paul's plea for the church of Ephesus. Stop stealing from each other. Stop taking, stop robbing each other. Instead, bind yourself, entangle yourself, enmesh yourself in the word of God, in the name of God, in the ways of God, in the grace of God, in the nature of God. Bind yourself. Or in other words, make every effort to align yourself with God and with each other. And this is so important because when we respond in ways that are not of God, for example, in a sexual immoral way or in a selfish, greedy kind of way or in a foolish or coarse kind of way or in a lustful kind of way or in an untruthful kind of way or any kind of way that robs, that takes, that steals from another person, when we respond in this way, we unwrap God from our lives. And when we unwrap God from our lives, our lives have a habit of unraveling. Our social lives, our spiritual lives, and our home life. And so this is why God gives to us his commandments. Not to inform us how to gain access to God, or so that we can earn our way in with him, or try to impress him. Because when you open the pages of, of Scripture, it becomes evident that God gives his rules and he gives his laws and his commandments to people who were already in relationship with him. You see, many years ago, God brought the nation of Israel out of Egypt and said to them, you are my people. And because I've heard your cries for help, here I am. I have chosen you to be my people and for me to be your God. And so now that we are family, now that we are in relationship, this is how we're going to live together. Not so that you can impress me, but because I want what's best for you. I want you to live life well. I want you to live life well. And here's what wellness looks like. I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. So you must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them or misuse my name. And remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for ordinary work, but on the seventh day, rest. And dedicate that to me. In other words, this is what God was saying to the Israelites and to us. I want to be front and center in your life. 
I don't want to be a component of your life, but in your whole life. And when I'm front and centre in your life, if I'm what life is all about for you, then you must not steal. And why? Because you'll depend on me. And you must not murder, because after all, you'll be depending on me as your judge. And if I'm front and centre in your life, then you must not commit adultery, because you will learn to find contentment in what I've provided for you. This is why God has given to us his commandments or his laws or guidelines or principles or whatever you want to call them. Not because he wants to limit our life, but because he wants us to enjoy life. Not so that we would miss out on life, but so we would experience life. And not just any life, but a free, joyful kind of life, which is wrapped up in God. Free, but wrapped. Free from despair, entanglement, and all those things that enslaves, but wrapped up in God. Free, but wrapped. Wrapped in the Word of God, the name of God, the ways of God, the grace of God, and the nature of God. There's a story in Luke's Gospel about a man named Zacchaeus. And you may have heard this story before, quite recently, in fact. And the story goes like this. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief collector in the region. And so I want to pause here just for a moment Tax collectors were frowned upon in Jesus' day because they were thought to be corrupt. They didn't just collect your tax. They tried to rip you off from everything that you owned. And so tax collectors were very, very wealthy men. And they gathered their wealth by robbing from their community. And Zacchaeus wasn't just any tax collector. He was the chief tax collector. So he was in charge of all the other tax collectors in the region. So as you can imagine, the town hated Zacchaeus. Verse 3. He, as in Zacchaeus, tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. So out of all the people in town, Jesus wants to hang out with Zacchaeus. So Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased, no doubt. He has gone to the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Now, what exactly unfolds at Zacchaeus' home, we have no idea. Luke doesn't seem to think that it's worth mentioning. But something must have happened. Because the change in Zacchaeus' life after this one encounter with Jesus is quite astonishing. In just one afternoon with Jesus... He goes from stealing from his community to providing for his community. And and we ask, how did this happen? You know, did Jesus ask him about his job? Or why people dislike him so? Or did Jesus just look around at his house? Ooh, Zacchaeus, Ah, pretty nice. For four, boy, very nice. We don't know. Maybe Jesus just simply asked him about his name. Asked him what his parents' aspirations for him when they named him Zacchaeus. Because Zacchaeus means pure. Pure. What happened, we don't know. But what we do know is this, verse 8. Zacchaeus stood before the Lord, that's Jesus, and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. 
And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Now, as generous as this sounds, and this is very generous, the law stated that if you had cheated someone in some way, you were to pay back seven times the amount. Seven times. But Jesus doesn't get caught up in the law of the letter here. Instead, he sees a man who wants to become pure. And he says to him, he responds, Salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. So the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. So what do you need to put right? What do you need to put right? What have you stolen? Is it something tangible, like money or someone else's possessions? Or maybe you've stolen from a business or an institution of some sort, whether that be work or government, a hotel, motel, social club or church. Or maybe you've stolen something far more valuable. You've robbed someone of their life or their childhood or their youth. Or you've taken something valuable like a family member from someone else's family. Or maybe you have never apologised to someone or forgiven someone. Or maybe you've stolen from God. Maybe you've always assumed that everything you own is yours alone. And so you live life always taking, always, re always receiving, but never giving any of it back to God or to charity or to a church. J. John, the author of the Just Ten series, this series that we're currently working through, um, says this, but before I quote him, um, I think it's important that I quote him once in a while. Um, if you want to get the full benefit of Just Ten, um, try and get the videos, because the way J. John presents his material um, and the little bit of his that I use and the lot that I add, if you want to get the full scope of Just Ten, it'd be interest it worthwhile exercise to watch the videos. See Sharon after the meeting. Get yourself into a home group. I believe some of the home groups are working through the material. But John, J. John puts, puts it like this very succinctly. The person who makes a mistake and doesn't correct it is making another mistake. The person who makes a mistake and doesn't correct it is making another mistake. And so this morning, I want to give you the opportunity to bring salvation, that is deliverance and a rescuing, to your life and to your circumstances. And also give you the chance to bring salvation, a renewing of wrong, a repairing, a restoring to the person or to the institution you have robbed from. And maybe you've lived life feeling as though someone or something has stolen from you. Whatever this means for you, through the cross of Christ and the blood of Christ, we can live a life restored, repaired, saved, free, free. And so this is what we can do this morning through the week firstly in front of us at the front of the hall we have a bowl of red water it's not jelly <laughs> red water that represents the blood of christ and so this morning we have this opportunity just in an act of restoration and an act of setting free of taking that thing that we've stolen. You don't need to write anything down this morning. Just this paper at the front will act as that thing this morning and just burn it in the blood of Christ this morning. Just a way of setting free.
saying, this thing that I've stolen no longer rules over me. Maybe you've been stolen from. Maybe you've been robbed in some way, whether that's physically, emotionally, spiritually, and you're still holding on to that thing, and that's still robbing you. Then you have that opportunity this morning just to come. It's an act of handing it over to the cross, to Jesus, to his blood. Again, taking just this bit of paper, whatever that represents, and burning it in the blood of Christ. We have this opportunity to do this this morning. Step one. Step two. Is I want you to think about if you've stolen something, whether it's from a person or an institution or a workplace or a social club or from church, whatever it is you have stolen, think about giving it back this week. You know, Zacchaeus received from God that moment he gave back what he had taken. So go to that person this week or that place and give back. Or maybe again, if it's you that feels like you are the one that's been violated, and it's a big step, but maybe that will bring peace by seeking out that person that has wronged you and giving to them resolution, forgiveness or grace. Maybe you've taken something just recently or long ago and you're unable to face that person or that place again. You still have to give it back. And so over the next few weeks, this ugly-looking black bin will be sitting at the doorway, the entrance to the church. You'll have to pass it for the next few weeks as you walk in here. I want to give you the chance to put whatever it is that you're holding on to or, or something that represents what you've taken and to place it into the amnesty bin. I'm not on, uh, on any witch hunt here this morning. No questions will be asked. Not one. Not one. We're not chasing anyone up over this. This bin may remain empty for the next three weeks. I don't know. It may not. But here's your chance to write what has been wronged. Now, depending on the nature of what goes in the bin, some of it may be thrown out. I certainly won't be, we certainly won't be profiting by what goes into the bin. We'll be donating if it's helpful for community ministries or to our family store or to charity or to whatever. But it's our chance just to get rid of that stuff that weighs us down. You see, you can live life denying it. Denying that we've made mistakes or have not stolen anything from anyone. We can live our lives denying it or we can live our lives deflecting it, you know, blaming it on other people for our behaviour and for our circumstances. We can live life drowning it, and many do, in alcohol or drugs or whatever. Or we can dissolve it, dissolve it by wrapping it. That's our lives as well as that thing or those things that we've stolen in the word of God and the name of God and the ways of God, the grace of God and the nature of God. Now, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. And Jesus didn't utter those words to Zacchaeus when he walked into the home of Zacchaeus or into Zacchaeus' life. But in that moment, when he declared to give over what he had taken, when he declared to give back more than what he had received, and we too can receive salvation and freedom. For it comes to us in that moment when we too give over to God. 
when we give our lives over to God, when we give those things that have entrapped us, that steal from us, that take from us, and for some of us, it may even be those things that we have first taken from someone or something else. But it's then, it's then when we wrap those things as well as our things, our lives and our family and our circumstances and our actions in the word of God and the name of God, the ways of God and the grace of God, the nature of God, it's then when we hand those things over, it's then, it's then, it's then, it's then, I can't say that enough, it's then, in that moment, when we hand it over, or wrap it up, it's then when we find true freedom and salvation. And so this is what we're going to do this morning. Rather than the music team leading this next song, um, we'll play just a media clip. And while the clip plays, I'm going to ask, firstly, that our music team, if they wish to respond in this way, there's no pressure, they don't have to, but if you wish to respond in this way, before heading up to the platform um, to bring the song after the clip, you'll first have this opportunity to come and to bring whatever it is to God. And then we'll invite the rest of the congregation to do so. I don't know about you, but I've never physically robbed from someone. I remember as a child... Um, stealing from a shopping center. I was badgering my mum for, um, I can't even remember what it is. I think it was a party toy of some sort. You know, the little thing that you put in your mouth and you blow and it goes, and, it, and the paper unwrap. I think it was that, but I'm not sure. M maybe a friend of mine had one. And so I went home, mum, I've got to have this. I've got to have this. I've got to have this. No, no, no. Well, she goes out shopping. And so I go shopping with her. And lo and behold, on the shelf is this thing that I wanted. And somehow it moved from the shelf into my hand, into my pocket. And that afternoon, I was playing with it. And mum looks and goes, where'd you get that from? Hmm, I don't know. <laughs> she took it from me and marched me back to the store and I had to stand before the, um, the manager of the store and apologise for stealing. That was helpful for me. Um, I don't go around stealing anymore. But there are those times when I've stolen emotionally from people. And so this morning, this is what this paper represents for me. That's what I'm going to hand over to God. Those moments when I've emotionally stolen from someone. So what about you? What do you have to do to find freedom? And freedom that Christ can give from you. Yeah.